This is Precision Agriculture in the Southeast, and I'm Mark Hall. I'm an Extension Specialist with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. And more importantly than me is Dr. John Fulton, our agronomy team leader, precision ag expert for Auburn University. This has been a real learning experience for me, John, on precision agriculture. It's, it's something we need to do. Most of our farmers are doing, I don't know as most of them, but boy, a high percentage of them are doing it. And where I got started was on today's lesson, soil fertility. That was like the number one thing. And my, my old high school classmate, uh, Bus Smith up in Athens, you know, the co-op got into that grid sampling that we talked about last time on two and a half acres. This is a big selling point, soil fertility. And with fertilizer prices as high as they are, it's, it's more important now than ever. Yeah, and we're not only talking about fertility, but we're also talking about trying to grow our organic matter. So we're making some measurements there. We're pushing soil health in this country. And so it's soil and fertility, the pH aspect, you know, as critical as it is to, to maintain and profitability at the farm and across the field. So all we're gonna do in this mark is probably the biggest question that, that our farmers ask is, what do I need to go out and do this and just give some thought to this uh, as we go through? Uh, talk about some of the tools that you do need or would have to purchase, but just also just kind of get in your mindset. What you know, what am I getting myself into? Is this so? We're just going to focus really uh, kind of narrow it down and talk about fertility and anything that we're going out and doing a soil core and pulling that and, and doing some analysis on that. So this is all we're, we're talking about steps. So you know, just backing up site-specific management. We're just fundamentally trying to require our input needs based on measured variability out there. And, and so as we apply fertilizers, now we're talking about matching seeding rates to yield potential. And so, you know, that's what site-specific management is about, is taking the field and talking about what the intrafield variability is and, and managing. And so there's a lot of common sense ideas that can be employed, you know, but, uh, you know, can you use that on your farm and do some on-farm research to kind of fine-tune your uh, farm operation. We'll go start back here. You know, we're trying to implement site-specific management. Ultimately, we know we're trying to drive uh, potentially zones, but we could use grids. Uh, go to that lesson and talk about what the difference is. But, you know, our, our big thing is there is no best approach. Start somewhere and allow yourself to grow with it and, and learn as you go. And so if, if variability exists, and a high percentage of the fields here in Alabama, Mark, we know variability exists. See what you can measure and see if it's willing, if you're willing to invest and, and try and make it more profitable. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, we're talking about some directed soil sampling today. We'll uh, talk about its precision soil sampling on, on our website. Again, there's grids, it's about two and a half acre on average. You know, it's a quick way to get a snapshot. You really don't have to know any field knowledge out there. Uh, as we grow in samples, we're going to have to spend more money. Uh, and it's very labor intensive because, you know, we can have um, 50 grids out there, and if we zoned it out, we might only have four or five zones. So there's some differences, but yet a little bit different in approach. And, and so consider it. Zones could be anywhere from, on oh, nominally, it's 10 to 20 acres. It could be five. It could be smaller as you, as you kind of define what that zone. But you got to have something in-house some kind of knowledge, some kind of data sets, and the time required to generate these zones. Uh, whether you're going to do that yourself, probably 95 or 96 percent uh, of our farmers are going to have someone help them do this mm -hmm. because that time involvement to come and derive these zones. So there's a little bit more setup and time in that zone process, and so that's why a lot of times you'll see guys start with grid. I get a field boundary, I can grid it out, and I don't need you know an extensive. Uh, data set to really get the zones defined. The the guys, I, I was amazed the first time I saw it, but they have a forerunner with an automatic yeah. soil sample puller, and they know what they're doing, and boy, they can just come in and phew, 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 and you got it. Yep. So two ways. There is no set way, no best way. It's get your comfort zone and, and start doing something. Uh, so the first step, you know, is we're going to, break it down and we're going to talk field by field. Uh, I think science and what we've been able to do in our precision ag program, that's the first thing. Get your mindset that it's a field by field 
and what works in one might not be mm -hmm. the same thing that I want to do in the, uh, the other, but I want to try and drive down and look at that field and look at the profitability and make some. Can I characterize the soil uh, and landscapes? You know, Dr. Shaw's done a tremendous amount of research on this end, uh, at developing and improved soil surveys. Uh, you can get train attributes, slopes, um, you know, in my northern face and southern east west mm -hmm. facing there's a lot of that information you can get and sometimes you can get free data sets to develop this soil electrical conductivity or soil ec uh, is something uh, that uh, a lot of uh, uh, services will provide they'll come out and do a soil ec map and sometimes that does a great job of defining texture it does a good job down in our sandy soils in the southern part of the state not quite as good in the northern part, but is a, is something that you can start to look at and say uh, how I might zone or, or break that field up in the in areas to manage. And then you know there's some other things, texture and this um, organic carbon or organic matter depth of topsoil in some cases. Mark, you know we've got mm -hmm. a lot of eroded soils, and I can look at do I even have topsoil and what's the depth, and and that could be a primary driver of how I break fields up too. So there's a lot of ways to break your soils up. Most people aren't going to have this in house immediately, but you know, think about ways to get some of the free data, and, and a lot of these services will help you start to to develop some of this. Our biggest thing is get out with your farmer, or if you're a farmer, get people out there talking. What's your management strategies? What have you been doing? What makes sense? Should I be zones? Should I make make uh, grids? You know, choose that yourself as a farmer, but get out there and talk about it. And, and see what makes the most sense to you. I'd find a better group than that to talk to, John. <laughs> uh, those are pretty smart individuals there. Yeah, they are. There. I and say that jokingly, but Daniel's a sharp cookie, and he's, in, he's doing that now. Absolutely, and AJ's now doing some work, and Simmerjeet and Jonathan definitely, all, all those guys are doing Good guys. You know, work in this area, and I think they all would tell you, you know, you gotta get out there and talk about yep. your land and what makes most sense. So. That's our thing. Step one, get out there and talk about it. Get your field boundaries map. If nothing more, a lot of times you'll be surprised just by your acreage that you get from this map. I've been tilling this for 30 years. I've always thought it was 40 acres. The next thing you know, it's 38, it's 42, it's 43. And you've been paying rent on 45 and you got 32. So, but the first thing is, no matter what your approach is, you gotta get a, a field boundary. Really, there's two ways to do it. You can get an ATV or, or a mapping unit with a GPS and go out and do a field boundary. But in some cases, in most of these farm management information systems, I can do it, get a, a, a basically a, a, a visible remote sense imagery like you see at the bottom and draw them in manually or have someone draw them in. And so I don't have to go out to the field uh, it'd be best to go to the field so you really define where, where am I really uh, managing to, what's that real boundary, but you know, Google Earth and will allow you to draw in boundaries. Uh, so two ways to, to do that, but once I have my boundary, now the next step is I gotta have an, usually an ATV or a mule or something. I got my GPS receiver, DGPS, I got some kind of computer to collect data with mapping software, I connect them up and I'm out there you know, basically doing my boundary mapping, which ultimately then becomes my vehicle to go out and collect soil samples, Mark. So I need to, typically a vehicle, or you're gonna be out there mm -hmm. all day, the GPS receiver, some kind of handheld in today or a computer that has the software that allows you very easily to get your, your uh, boundary, but also allows you to go out and navigate to points. And when we started, we'd, we'd strap that on our back Oh, that was low man on the totem pole job to have to carry that thing around the field. I remember spending days Ooh. walking fields and it that took was, some time. That was torment. So today, you know, whether it's a four-wheeler or some kind of so these ATVs today, and they're pretty fast and you trying to be as efficient as possible. But that's what you need, you know, and a lot of, lot of options out there from a computer and software. And a lot of these software packages are very easy to use today. Now they do cost some money, Mark, but they've really improved uh, the simplistic uh, stepping through. I need to collect a boundary, or I'm going to go out and sample. I need to load a map. You know. Well, it's one of those things, John. <clears throat> I mean, Precision Ag is going to make you money, and let's get it in doable chunks. Pay somebody to do some of this stuff. I mean, it, you'll make money. You'll get yeah. a return on that investment. That you don't have to do every little thing yourself. You can. There's help. 
Absolutely. And most, like I said, on most of this, like especially on the soil sampling end, uh, you know, all of our input suppliers selling us CPS, you know, the, the co-op or agri AFC stores, they're all providing that soil sampling. Mm -hmm. uh, it can help you generate your grids and zones. So you don't have to spend the time on any of that. Just a little kind of housekeeping. Number one, there's a lot of handheld, little handheld computers. We use tablets today in our program, you know, and, and these can range from, you can spend $500 up to, you know, almost $4,000 getting some of these. But it's just not that, it's, it's really the software that you want. And so you can go to a, an Ag Leader or Trimble, um, uh, some of these other software companies and get an in-field software package that you can collect data with, you know, we're going to talk about just real briefly, you know, can they make a shapefile? Because most of all these programs, and shapefile is an ESRI, you can go out and learn about it. But at the end of the day, if it can do a shapefile, you can collect point data, line data, or area data, like a boundary, you know. And it, does it save it in a shapefile? Because if it does a shapefile, it's probably going to go into any software package, whether you're buying that software package, you're going back, getting someone to help you, they can accept that shapefile. The other thing is you can have generic text files. We're talking in the yield monitoring mapping, I showed some text files of data. Uh, but normally shape files are kind of somewhat standard today. So just be thinking about if I'm buying something, does it generate a shape file for me at the end of the day? Because I'm going to probably share that with someone to get them to help yeah. me or put it into my software. There's these proprietary type file formats. All of a sudden if I'm proprietary, then I'm going to have to have a a specific software program to read it and make it usable to me. And so if I'm asking someone to help me, they may or may not be able to handle that proprietary data. We're much better that to, at this today. We don't see a lot of issues sharing data from some of these handhelds to the software, but just recognize, that, yeah, there's some proprietary things that exist out there. John, what I like about the handheld, where I'll use that, is if I see a, a unique problem. I can get a location and, and then tell whoever needs to know, hey, this exists here. And not have to say, go to the old tree and turn right and blah, blah, blah. You can say, exactly, here it is. Absolutely. Go there and you'll see it. And one, one last thing to mention on this is that a lot of, lot of, there's some, a lot of app development. All of a sudden, I don't need a tablet. I don't need a uh, specialized handheld. You're seeing apps that allow you to collect this boundary data or do some of this sampling and, and in some cases are free of charge. Wow. And so you can take your smartphone and all of a sudden it can, without a lot of cost, go out and do some neat things like you said uh, out there. So we got our map, we got a field computer handheld or today we're talking our smartphone, we can go out and do some things. The thing is with a lot of these handhelds is they're hardened, they can hand up to the dirt and the environment we're sticking them in. Whereas your smartphone, as you know, Mark, uh, water and some of this environment can have a negative effect on it. So just keep keep that in mind that we're out in the out in the world and soil and farm and, and the environment we're sticking these into. Got my boundary map. I'm bringing it into my uh, software package. Again, this would be look just like if someone's helping me. They're going to probably have an aerial image of my farm. I can bring my yield map in and also, or no, excuse me, my boundary map. I can bring my yield data in too. And all of a sudden I'm building information for that field, uh, but the boundary map is the critical because everything I'm going to do is going to be based on that boundary map. So we want to make sure we get a good, accurate boundary map that we're going to do all of our management based upon. We got that in. Unique thing is if I'm using RTK, map, RTK to collect that data, which that's what we use in our program, I got a very accurate elevation data that I can use. And so all of a sudden I've got not only boundary, but I can go out and collect quickly some elevation data that might be very important on mm -hmm. how I choose to move forward here. So, got all that, I got my boundary map, I've got my system in place to go out and collect that. Now, how do I create those zones and grids? Again, go back to the other module and, and kind of figure out what's going to work best for you, but I've got to generate those and then ultimately the sampling side. Let's get back out and talk to the farmer. Okay, or the farmer needs to be talking to people. Let's, let's make sure the strategy that we're kind of thinking about is the right thing after we get those boundaries and someone else maybe even collected those. Uh oh, they need to maybe understand some things that you're, you're telling them, but once they see it, they understand it. So we're discussing, 
We come back out. What other data layers are out there that I could capitalize on? We got uh, images or visible images that are free. We got soil maps. I can bring elevation in in most of it. There's a lot of others, but at the end of the day, that farmer knowledge is very critical mm -hmm. to be involved in this equation. So if variability exists and it makes sense for that field, we're moving on. We can generate these uh, grids or zones and the sampling sites potentially. Sometimes you pay. Today there are some, some software out there that are free, but if I'm going to buy a service from someone, you're going to probably, you're going to have to pay for it, Mark. Uh, but once you decide it's zone or grid, uh, in this case we're looking at uh, both as examples, you get your sampling sites uh, and we can, we can develop that either using an ag GIS or farm management information. Uh, I can also be able to maybe draw some things. You know, I see some areas, hey, I want to I draw around that area because something's really going on in focus. So, um, you know, get in and someone either doing this for you or if I'm doing it, I'd break that up. In this case, I'm just giving an example of a, a, a grid at the top left. There's a one acre grids for this example. It puts a point at the middle. I take that point file that's on the bottom right, and that's what I want to take out to the field with me and navigate to those points. Those points are numbered. So I give it a field ID, so maybe this is field one, and then within that field I might have, you know, 30, 35 mm -hmm. sites, and they're already numbered. The important of that is, is I want to make sure my site to collect my soil sample matches up with the data that I send my to the lab, whether that's a private lab or to our lab here, I better make sure that however my nomenclature matches up so I can come back and tie that all back into making this work for me. So, head out to the field. Okay, I got my sites. I load those that shape file knit typically back onto this. And I've got my points in hand, and I've got my numbering system already established. And I got that already on the screen. And so, whether I have boxes or bags, I'm writing that information right on them. If I can print it out using a little printer, in some cases, I'm making sure that that point can get matched back to that soil sample. My equipment. Not only do I have a, an ATV. We've gone through some of this, but maybe I better have some flags just in case I need to mark something and come back to it. Have buckets. A lot of times we talk about having buckets, so as you've got multiple people, throw it in a bucket, mix it up, put it in the bag. Uh, do you have the coring device? You know, and do you have that measured in no-till from zero to six where you can get a, mm -hmm. uh, accurately a, a six inch? And you're just navigating the points, trying to spread out around that point or zone or making sure you get across that zone and collecting points. You combine, do a composite, put it in the bag, mark it appropriately, okay? But this is what you need. The biggest question most, most people are gonna have is do I have the right field computer or what do I use for that? And do I have the software to make this happen? Those are probably the biggest things because most everyone will have an ATV and the coring devices. It's computer software. And there's a lot of options out there. Here's an example. Just an example, there's some different ways. Uh, we grid sample and do five to eight cores minimum per grid, okay? Most of the times we're around that six, uh, six or seven, depending on the size. We'll drive to the grid center and then we'll spread out in you know a 20 foot radius and get six kind of uh, that, throw that in and that'll represent that grid. Again, just an example. I can zigzag back and forth. I've heard people doing that again, trying to get some representation, but it's what you're willing to spend time and pay for is the big thing. Zone sampling depends on the size, but we're somewhere between 10 to 20 cores minimum to represent that zone. So you got to go across that zone and get those cores, composite it, put it in the bag, label it, and you're going on. To help you out, again, here's, here's some examples for you. Mark, that you were talking about an ATV, it's got basically a, um, a drill on it with an auger, so you're not having to press that coring device in the ground each and every day. The GPS on the front, you got your uh, software there in front of you, you're driving, you're taking your cores, never getting off, and putting those cores in the, in the uh, rack on the back, and you're off. And that's a one-man show, mm -hmm. not multiple. And so there's some different ways. A lot of people, you're starting to see this more often as the uh, Wintex has a couple different options, but again, more of an automated. This can fit on an, a four-wheeler, can fit on a gator, can fit on a mule. You can buy all the, it just attaches, hydraulically driven in most cases, press down, and again, a one-man show, a lot of cores per 
um, per day. You know, that's the big thing. Can I? I got two thousand acres. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's going to take some time, and so these types of systems can really help and not hurt your back at the, at the end of the mm -hmm. day as well, Mark. Yeah. Ag robotics, just a couple of examples. They've got one. This is uh, hard to see. Uh, in this particular picture, but it does two cores, one on each side at an angle, pulls those cores, brings it in, and puts them in the bag automatically for you. They also have this automated auto probe that you probably people can go out and look at. Um, you probably more more likely see an input supplier providing services to have one of these, or some of the seed technology companies working on their research. But basically, you drive it across and it pulls cores across that field, brings them to the bag, you put them in the bag and you mark those bags and it does all that in the cab almost automatically other than the guy driving does have to drive and, and, and close the bag for you. So there's a lot of options to help you in this process so you don't have to have two, three, or four people out there doing it and that's all I'm saying is you can spend a little bit of money and do this, get it more auto automated. Here's GVMs, the agri-probes. I'm sure there's others out there but just think about it. If you're going to get into business or want to do this on your farm, are you willing to you know, work your back for several days on end to get your cores. Cheap enough to hire somebody who's got one of these machines to come in and do it for you. Absolutely. N normally, you'll find out, I'll try it one year, and the next year I'm willing yeah. to <laughs> pay for the service. That check gets smaller and smaller, <laughs> don't it? So, you know, so that just kind of gives you, you know, we want to we quantify. This is what we're trying to drive to. Can we quantify that field uh, spatial variability? Uh, fertility levels are big. Organic matter, we're starting to measure more and more of. And we talk about soil health, you know, some of the good work that Charlie Mitchell's doing, you know, and, and trying mm -hmm. to better look at the productivity of that soil. And then what can we do to improve that? So we're, we're just beyond fertility and pH today. We're looking at some other components. So we got our soil samples, Mark. We're going to send those either to a private lab or you're going to bring them down here to our public lab. You know, today, you know, all of our soil samples, our lab's doing a great job. You know, we, over the last year and a half, we've sent, you know, hundreds of samples in from all of our research sites, and within 24 hours, we have the results for the NPK and pH mm -hmm. back. I mean, it's just impressive to turn around. Plus, they give it to me in the format I like, a text file. Yeah. That's important. On the bottom left, you'll see oh. our report but I can get a text file of that, and all of a sudden I merge that back into my grid or zone file, and now I've got my grid, all the soil analysis for that grid or zone automatically tied back to that map. Okay, and I can do this in these Ag GIS programs, or if someone else is doing it, they will have. But the, our, our lab gives it to us in a text file. It's a very quick process. Uh, to tie that or merge that into that spatial data. And now not only do I have the map and my grid or zones, I've got all that fertility and possibly recommendations built back in to that map. So this is what it looks like. All of a sudden I can generate a bunch of maps. Uh, this one's pH, reds below 6, 6.0. Those are areas that we're going to need to focus on. Um, in terms of applying lime, and that's what we did in this scenario. We weren't applying lime to most of that field, but down to bottom on the southern edge of that field, you can see we had some areas that we needed to focus mm -hmm. on and get that back up into that acceptable range for, for what we're doing at that farm. Boy, that'd save you a lot of money right there. Absolutely. You're getting what you need where you need it. So on this field alone at this farm when we did this a few years ago, uh, there was about a $29 per acre savings on the, fertili on the uh, fertilizer bill. This is pH, as you can see, but the same thing. We had a lot of high P and K values, just not needed. And so mm -hmm. we were, you know, that was 2010 values, $29 an acre, Mark. You know, that's, that means something. We've done all that, so we go out and we're going we're gonna to apply that. Same field, this is a... Uh, um, basically a, a fertilizer prescription map, you can see three rates. Zero, green, basically the yellow and orange there, though the rates seem high, we're not putting a lot of product, not, not a lot of P205 or K20 out in that field. And again, there's a $29 straight off the top mm -hmm. savings by knowing this. This is a grid sample example, but you know we could have done the same thing if we're doing zones 
but you can see that there's some things we need to need to consider to maintain the level of fertility out there. So in summary, we didn't get through everything, but the idea here is hopefully you got some of the steps, some of the necessary technology to make this reality. It's not rocket science, Mark, in, in most cases. It's just a time. It's really a time commitment. Uh, but you do have to have a GPS, the software, uh, and some kind of handheld or computer in-house. In I can't emphasize enough that the farmer's knowledge is such a valuable data layer that it's got to be included in discussions. That's why we highlighted it in steps one and two. And then fertility, elevation, and other soil sampling, you know, organic matter in particular can be very valuable in how you proceed and maybe trying to improve organic matter. You know, as we promote no-till and conservation tillage, you know, we want to improve organic matter. We, we could potentially some of the drought conditions we get into. We know what that can mean to us of maintaining some profitability out there versus not having a crop at all. So that's what some of this can bring to the forefront. Um, hopefully it's been uh, education just to get started. That's what we're talking about. We're just getting started here. John, I think uh, the, main, the main takeaway is that you can do this. If you can plant a seed and harvest a crop, you can do this. And number two is there's folks out there that can help you. There are knowledgeable industry professionals that can help you get started and when you get into some kind of glitch they'll help you you'll they'll help you through it and don't be intimidated by just the volume of oh man that's a that's a lot of stuff well it is but let's just get started just get started and you'll be happy with the results our farmers can do this and it'll be a blessing to them and don't give up in year one just because you you thought yeah. you were going to get a result and that didn't quite work out maybe that's the result you needed to, to understand and to, but over time given time most all of our all of our folks when they start the guys start that's what we're talking about here today but given time it'll be profitable in the in the long haul for you thank you john